All right, guys, welcome back to another episode, and allow me to introduce my guest today, Danny Roberts. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing fantastic. I am much cooler today than I have been for the past week. <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that on a few different levels. As you know, uh, East Coast, we're kind of catching it a little bad with the heat waves so far in this summer. So it uh, hasn't been too kind on us in the heat regard. But Apparently, I read that a third of the U.S. population has been under extreme heat conditions this summer, which I think by, by now we should all realize this is the new norm. But a third of the country has been roasting. So I think there's a lot of people out there that can relate. A am I imagining things or does it seem like this summer in comparison to the last few is like astoundingly hot? No, you're not imagining it at all. Uh, the Southern Hemisphere had their hottest summer on record, so now we're following them with the same heat. <laughs> yeah. It's brutal. No, yeah, no kidding. But uh, what is like a typical day for you like now that uh, kind of the show has passed, the dust has settled, you know, we've kind of found the sweet spot to talk about all this stuff. It's not too far removed from when the show ended, but it's oh, also... Yeah. You know, Enough time I, has passed. Yeah. I, I, I got a little burned out from having these conversations, so I appreciate you pushing it back so that I have some fresh energy to talk about it. Um, it was an incredible experience. Very proud of it. Uh, there's you know an afterglow of love coming off of it. Um, I think now my day-to-day -day looks kind of a lot like it did before. Um, I'm a single parent. I spent a lot of my time parenting. And... Anybody who is a parent knows what that entails. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, you know, I have my own regular work in my regular life, too. Um, I'm a technical recruiter in the startup world. I hire product people, engineering, designers, et cetera. So I spend my, my days talking to those kind of people. Did doors ever close professionally, like when it came to the show back in the day originally? That's a popular question I like to ask my guests that uh, came up during like the earlier 2000s, if like doors were more so opening or closing when it came to jobs. It depends on what kind of doors you're talking about. And, and in my case, quite different than probably most people you talk to, which are typically hetero. Um, I think there is a degree that all of us can say that, yes, it's to you know more or lesser degrees depending on the person and their personality and their edit i think yes this absolutely impacts your professional abilities um it's really hard or it was really hard back in the day to escape who you were um i think you probably heard this from a lot in any professional setting you we were all kind of sort of seen as disruptions in many ways um mm -hmm. in the day-to-day -day norm and it's also just difficult to have a normal day-to-day -day life when the people you're interacting with are going, wait a minute, I know who you are, you know, and then there's that parasocial aspect that comes into play and it just makes those, those sorts of uh, professional relationships difficult. In my case, more extreme because when I did my show originally way back in the day and we, you know, we were cast in 99, filmed it in 2000, this was a time when it was very taboo to be out. Um, only people in the most, liberal of cities were, were capable of having out lives in any kind of way. Um, most people still lived in the closet at that point, especially in professional settings, because it was not only taboo, but it would, it would often get you fired um, at that time. Whereas now you see every corporation waving their pride flag, which by the way, I think is a bit of bullshit. Um, <laughs> this is, you know, 20 years ago, they were actively and proudly firing people who were out. So, I knew going into this, it was one of my biggest fears that I was greatly limiting my future professional abilities. Um, and I had just come out of university. So, you know, a year after that, I'm back out into in the real world again, um, looking at opportunities. And yes, on the, on the flip side of that, there are lots of doors that are open for some people. Less so back in this time, reality TV has become something very different now where I think most people do reality TV and they see it as a mechanism to leap into whatever, you know, career that may be. And for a lot of people, it is something entertainment related. Back then, that was not so much the case. Um, it was kind of, you did reality television and that was sort of the end of it for most people. Um, there was no internet for, for the majority of the, for majority of the population. So, there wasn't the ability to reach directly to audiences um, that impeded a lot to, to carry on with any sort of entertainment career. And that was never my goal either. I was 
never someone comfortable in, in being the center of attention. Um, in fact, one of my last college classes at the University of Georgia is I took an acting class to help myself get over the fear of just public speaking, public appearances. It's that that was my sort of um, mindset. So afterwards, I had no interest in carrying on with entertainment. Um, a lot of those doors were open for me. Um, I took them, they were open, but it's not always the case. Um, I think I was lucky at that time. Um, but I do think it stunted my professional career for years after that. Would you say it was more so just about like the added attention and eyeballs as a whole, or was it even more amplified due to the fact that you were out? Do you think like had say if like you were just a normal straight guy knowing yourself, like would you still feel those types of like anxieties from like the added pressure and eyeballs from like yeah. like you said, like a parasocial experiment? I think it, it would have felt a lot safer and more comfortable for me even though it's still would have, there would have been that parasocial level uh but yes i was you know very young newly out not super comfortable with it um and i talked about in in my homecoming season actually the result of going through that experience at the time again to remind people i was in a relationship a long-term eight-year relationship with a guy who happened to be in the military at the time and it was not actually allowed to be openly in the military so we had to live a very secretive closeted life for for a few years after my show when he was still in, in the army um he was actually an uh airborne captain too so oh. he wasn't just a guy in the military like he was leadership yeah uh, in an elite unit too so um th those were those were pretty scary weird years where i did become a bit of a close and a recluse um here, here I am in my cabin in Vermont. This is <laughs> a theme in my life of running and hiding from people. But yeah, I was very not comfortable going out into public um, unless it involved going to a bar and drinking alcohol and forgetting where I was. Um, I had well, made you're getting paid to do that though, Matt, right? Wasn't sometimes, that yes, sometimes yeah. yes, but not always. Um, okay. You know, I tried to carry on with a normal social life too, but um yeah there was a lot of anxiety about going out into public for years afterwards much less going into any sort of professional setting eventually i did and that was a huge leap for me to to get past that but even years later it was a thing still big time um how far before uh homecoming would you say like where the pressure and like the eyeballs had kind of died down. Like, did you make like a conscious effort to kind of go private at any point? Yeah, I, I think, I think you, you, Melissa probably spoke to a lot about this. We had very similar experiences where we worked really hard to regain our privacy um, and, and disappeared into the woodwork. Um, mm -hmm. She and I both had very quiet private lives. In fact, um, we hardly spoke to each other at all. We even lost touch with each other. Um, I think that was partly an instinct to separate ourselves from the entire experience, um, just to erase it. You know, I'd say probably eight years after the original, I sort of did meld into the to the woodwork and, and found my privacy and got my private life back and, and moved on, um, which was why going back to do this homecoming um, there was a lot of stress in that there was you know it took almost a year of negotiating with them and, and hundreds of conversations between especially me melissa and kelly about whether or not this was a good idea you know it's reopening pandora's box that we worked hard to put away um i would say that Probably the one of the biggest elements of going back to do it, though, was the compensation this time. We were not compensated the first time. We were young. We didn't know better. Um, you know, meanwhile, MTV of Vita Murray made millions upon millions off of us, but we, we made nothing. So we sort of saw going back to do this as a, a bit of restitution for the, that earlier run. And I was just saying this last week. It was essentially like you had all these like late teen, young 20 year olds going and putting their entire lives and stories like out on national TV. And like, basically like, it was almost like a new experiment. Like it was all like, nobody really knew essentially, I would say through the first like 10 or so seasons or 11 seasons, um, what the show really was. You know what I mean? Like everybody was going into this kind of blindly 
and they weren't necessarily getting like the compensation to that you'd probably expect when you're putting your entire story out there for anybody in the world to kind of interpret. And then you're basically afterwards kind of left to go fend for yourself in the normal life with zero to or little to none uh, kind of mental care after. Yeah, um, there was there was none. No one had a yeah. clue back in the day what the outcome was. The, re- the, 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 the truth is, is that the real world was really it wasn't the first reality television show, but it was the first mainstream widely popular reality television show that people watched like the majority of young people watched at the time for many years but no one had a clue what came out on the other side you know the original cast members also they all sort of for the many of the same reasons i think they all disappeared and went on and regained their privacy in their own lives so it's not like any of us had to touch with each other um nowadays though there's an incredible amount of research out there there's so many reality tvs on uh, TV shows on. If you go and you research on Google, it's really easy to find reams upon reams of academic research on the topic now. And it's not a pretty picture. Um, it's very clear. There's a, there's a, you know, it's not, not to say this happens for everyone, but it's very clear that it's a negative experience for many, many, many people. It's very, it's very unsettling um, to sort of ironically By taking part in reality television, you turn reality upside down in your real life. Um, Parasocial relationships is a huge part of that. But, you know, through our adult lives, we were not aware of any of this, Um, nor did anyone really, from the production side, nor did anyone really take any responsibility. Um, It wasn't until, I I think when New York started, was was, uh, filming there, new homecoming that's when melissa and i found each other and it was the first time we had spoken probably over a decade and we uh, both immediately started reconnecting bonding over what we had been through through the years and realizing we've been through many similar things and that's when we both started to do the research and discover wow okay we're not the only ones there's there's clearly patterns out there um it's not it's not an easy experience to come through especially when you're really young that's the biggest part of it. We're talking about people who are in their late teens and very early 20s who barely know themselves, who are being thrown out into the world, being extremely vulnerable, which is what you're speaking to, um, really, really sharing a lot about themselves, that's about ourselves, that are that is very private, much of it, um, without any understanding of what the ramifications will be on the other side. Mm-hmm. And you have no idea what your edit is going to be either. Yeah, that's also a very big part because you don't really, I mean, you can control like what you say. Like if you say something, it very evidently came out of your mouth, but you can't control like the order or the context in which that is placed in. You know what I mean? The truth is, is anything you say can be taken out of context in a million different ways. Um, In fact, I know for a fact, because one of the producers said this directly to me, people who talk incessantly and have very scattered thoughts and who don't have very clear style of communication are actually the best for them to edit. Because though in a conversation with a person like this, they may be very difficult to follow, but for production, they're feeding them endless clips to work with. Um, there's some, there's a couple of people in my cast that fall into that category who, uh, you know, yes, you can control what comes out of your mouth, but the more you say, the more fodder you get production for edit. Um, and, and, you know, we all went back to this knowing from the first experience that anything you say can be weaponized and used against you. So it's, it's pretty scary. That's why going back to do it the second time was not something we chose to do lightly. Um, because when you, you reach this stage in life and life is good, you've built a, a solid life. Going back to do this is a lot of... Um, there's a there's a, a huge risk in, in doing this at this stage in life. I, I take it you, most of you were probably taken aback or taken by surprise rather to be getting the phone call to do it this soon into the game, considering they went first two seasons were the first two makes sense, you know, in order, and then it did the jump all the way to nine. And obviously, like there's reasons because you know maybe you can't get all seven for other seasons. So you guys probably didn't have like a ton of 
time I take it to like even prepare yourselves to kind of hop back into this? To be honest, we never thought they would get two hours. Um, we logically looked at it and we we made the assumption they're going chronologically in order. Um, it was very clear which seasons they were going to choose. They, they choose the ones that had the highest highest viewership back in the day combined with, um, yes, it's, it is a, a must that the entire cast must agree to it. So, you know, yes, there's possibly seven or eight casts that we, we assume they would choose before us, and we assume they would never make it to ours. So, no, we were not being expecting at all to hear from them whatsoever. Um, they actually reached out to me first to test me first because they knew that I was likely one of the ones to say no first. Um, I, I've had a history with with production over the years and conversations with them ab about uh, outcomes and, and their responsibility with cast mental health. So they, they knew very much where I stood with them in the entire experience, um, which was not entirely positive. So they tested me first and then we spent Melissa. That's that's why Melissa Kelly and I spent a while debating this. Um, and, you know, that was probably eight months the first phone call came eight months before we actually filmed it wow yeah so what was like your maybe i guess viewpoint as far as like mental health stance when it came to them were you somebody maybe that was advocating for maybe a system in place like for those to get done doing the shows advocating for them to, to for them meaning production um executives to have more ownership over outcomes, to take more responsibility, to provide support, what cast members need to readjust and move on in life. Um, you also have to think about a lot of people who are chosen for this show are not stable to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, they're purposely casting people who make great television because many of these people, you know, most of us come with some sort of baggage to begin with that's not easy to, to cope with in day-to-day -day life. So this is adding a whole new layer of, of that difficulty in life to everyone. Um, whether it's, you know, my case where it so happens that my personal life was in direct contradiction to professional and, 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 and um, my partner's life. And, you know, but then you've got many other people who are cast because they have mental health problems to start with. They have addictions, whatever the case that makes for good television, but makes life afterwards a nightmare. So I was advocating for production to be more responsible. Um, and to be honest, they were not really wanting to hear it. Um, I will say today, um, because there is so much data out now, because there have been so many really negative outcomes. I mean, how many, there's, do, if you take a look, it's been quite a few deaths on their hands, um, you know, not directly, but in many indirect ways. So some of some of the laws with production now are a little more protective of of cast members, but it's paper thin. Um, you know, for instance, going to film any reality show now, um, it is standard practice in the industry that everyone has to go through a psychological analysis. What does that mean, though? Not much, clearly. I mean, if you look at my homecoming season, there's clearly someone on there who maybe should not have passed that. <laughs> like, that just make that shows you right there, like, what are they really looking for? Uh, are they just covering themselves? I don't know. It does make you kind of wonder, right? Like, I mean, you guys actually took the test, so you would know better, but it seems like... The psychological tests maybe aren't so psychological at the end of the day as much as it is kind of just like standard procedure. Yeah, that's what I think, too. Um, but not, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not here to, to trash them. I, I just I think that's still something that where there's a lot of work to be done. I think reality television's going to stick around with us. Um, it's so popular today, it's insane. Um, I, I think there is just way healthier ways to go about doing it. Are you surprised by maybe the reception that your show got? Because I think when the whole uh, genre of just homecoming came out, nobody really knew like if it would stick or land or like what would come of it. But uh, it's very clear that 
even though like the odds were kind of like stacked in homecoming stacked against homecoming rather due to like social media playing such a heavy part stories and like you know conversations start to feel less organic or less real because of the heightened like added eyeballs and now just the sheer precedent set by other now reality shows such as like you know the jersey shore and like all oh, the kardashians you know like the the lines get blurred a little bit but yeah. i think that you guys despite that kind of were able to kind of were able to overcome that and kind of bring us back a ways because we talked about you guys not talking for such a long time you guys were very evidently a group that yeah you guys haven't talked for 22 years whereas like maybe other casts were kind of going to each other's family barbecues like you could very evidently see that there were no real conversations being had um so i want to kind of ask you now like how do you feel about the reception maybe now that the dust is settled are you happy with how it all turned out or does there feel like there's some meat still left on the bone there? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and this was such a, an eye opening part of the experience for me that personally I had with some of my younger coworkers, you know, I work in tech, so I work with a lot of people who are in their twenties. These are people that didn't generally grow up watching real world, never really heard of it even, or if they do know of it, they know of the later seasons, which are something entirely different from the earlier seasons. You know, I'd say around probably the season after mine, the, plat the, the, the platform started to really change um, and become more like what we think of, of, of as reality television today, which is salacious, huge personalities, competition, fighting, just all of the all of the things that we think of when we think of reality TV today. So. You know, in my professional life, mentioning to people I was going to do this I was like one, like, what? What is this? Uh, what is the real world? And then, you know, and then and explaining to them, OK, this is this is the premise of it. They just didn't get it at all. Like, like this is a lot to them. It's like, what? This is an hour long TikTok. <laughs> 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 yeah. The idea of just documentary style television is something completely foreign today when it comes to reality TV. Um, I think for our cast, yeah, you're right. In fact, going into this, one of the reasons we ultimately thought felt safe going to do it was we convinced ourselves no one was going to see it anyhow. So it was just going to sort of disappear <laughs> into the background, no matter how atrocious it may end up being. The fact that it was on Paramount Plus, which is not something that a lot of people had or have had, now more people are starting to get access to it, but um we really didn't think many people would see it but i think two things led to one is i think just when people do the people who did watch real world back in the day think fondly of our our season specifically um and a few others um i think it was sort of the peak viewership for millennials they were hitting the right that generation was hitting the right age um, to really be into it. So it had a huge audience back in the day. And then I think what really made the outcome of this actually generally positive and something that people are really into is because there was a genuine reconnecting happen with what, what were essentially, again, strangers, kind of like the original. We had all lost entire, complete touch with each other for the most part. So there was a lot of genuine interaction and just getting to know each other almost for the first time again. Um, some of us were so entirely different. We, there was that element too. Um, and I think, so I think people really enjoyed that watching it. Um, just the openness, the vulnerability, the genuineness, which you don't see a lot of in reality TV today. Mm -hmm. I know a big part uh, of the story that was not kind of showcased that you talked about a little bit in articles was like your HIV positive story. Yeah. Um, they chose to not show that. Why, why do you feel that was? Yeah. Um, that asked, you know, there were, there were three key goals that I wanted to approach in going into this. And I made it very clear to production as we were going through the, you know, the final stages of negotiating and agreeing to do this. Um, one was addressing the issue of religion, religion around sexuality, which happened. Um, two is I really, really, really wanted to, I wanted one of the stories to actually be about New Orleans this time, not just us. Um, there was the fact that, you know, that city's been through a lot. It was decimated 
by Hurricane Katrina. And it's a very different place today. We actually did touch on that. Um, we spent a couple of days filming around that. Unfortunately, that was all cut out too, which is a bummer. Um, New Orleans just constantly gets shown as a one dimensional town where people go to party, but it's such an incredible, unique city. Um, that has a very complex history. So that's that's unfortunate. The other piece was, yes, I was very clear that I wanted to be open and talk about my HIV diagnosis, which happened about eight years ago or so. And it was important to me because people today understand I, HIV in incredibly different ways. Um, you've got some people today who are incredibly informed, understand the science, where medicine is now, what it means, but you have just as many people, if not more so, who are sort of still stuck in the 90s mindset um, of this being a disease that ends in death or something horrible. It still carries a load of stigma, which is unreal today. Um, and a lot of that is still intertwined around the homophobia that came with HIV originally. Um, and a lot of people, if not most people today, do not understand where science and medicine is now and what it means to be undetectable. So that was super important for me to talk about, to get that out there, and also just to talk about how fucked up our healthcare system is. Um, and when you have any sort of chronic illness, what it means in your life when you become a slave to our healthcare system. I thought that was super important and relevant to talk about. And we did, but it did, it all was edited out. The reasoning I was given was I think I, it does not feel genuine to me um doesn't even matter to go into it I think ultimately what happened was there's only so much that can make the final cut in any given reality show and they made a decision that Julie's story and chaos was more important than this story and others um, you know, I think probably all of us could say there was some important aspect of ourselves that we wanted to share that got cut because for those who've seen it, you know, a good 50% of this show, I think, is the Julie Chaos Storm. Yeah. I mean, and if they wanted to showcase that, they still could have showcased her story in, like, about how she left the Mormon church. But it kind of felt like a lot of everybody's, like, key details or key stories were kind of pushed to the wayside to kind of just document, like, just antics of her that were going on on the side without real like substance behind it you know what i mean and it's um, not what people were tuning in for you know people really connected with those first episodes because it really showed change and growth and everyone but then halfway through it takes a hard turn into the julie circus um and they did you know really lean on that as as a mechanism to pull in viewers which is so much of what all reality TV show is now, let, let, let's show the chaos monkey. Um, and I think where they went wrong was there, there was a beautiful story to be told there. And yes, Julie left the Mormon church. And yes, that, that experience did some damage to her. Um, and they really could have genuinely focused on that side of her story and how she manages or doesn't manage that instead they chose to just focus on the salaciousness of it um and i you know at the end of the day it's a complicated relationship i have with her but i feel bad for her uh i'm always i'm an empathetic person i feel like julie came into this entire experience originally very closed off to the world, very limited understanding, left the church, and is now in a period in her life where she's, I think, living out things that most of us discover in our 20s that she never got to have, in our teens even. So there's this stunted development, this um, arrested development with her, and television brings out people like that, I think, the worst aspects of themselves. You know, wanting to relive sort of the things that a 20 would have been natural for a 20 year old back then filming. Like it. trying to fill a void in a sense. Filling like, voids, exactly. Yeah. And thinking that this is great. This is great. Also being highly aware of what makes for good television in her eyes. Um, 
that's where a lot of the manipulation comes into play. And I think there's a lot of narcissism at play there. Um, and it, yeah, it just, it, every, every storyline with her made me cringe, mm -hmm. um, cringe for her and just cringe for viewers. <laughs> <laughs> it is not okay to have sex with your husband when you have children at home in the middle of a courtyard, people. <laughs> Dude, oh my god. The I think the cringiest moment was the hall pass. <laughs> yeah, like, that was pretty bad too. That was, Who knows that, how much of it was even real or true too. The the thing that amazed me was like it seemed like she also had her own period where like, you know, like she she calls it her vapor period where, you know, she went off the grid and kind of like, you know, isolated from like the social media and like the whole real world reality stuff probably even similar or maybe more so than you did when it came to like more so privating yourself but like for her to be that in tapped into like what makes like good television today it was a little like coming out of left field you know like i expected her to be one of the ones that like was more so foreign to all this stuff but the fact that like she knew like kind of what they were looking for in a sense these days was kind of interesting to me you're saying she claims to have gone separated herself from this world at some point yeah yeah hmm. about mid 2000s that's not the sense I got, but okay. <laughs> I definitely know one thing that was never revealed was that Julie for years did actual television shows in Canada. She hosted, she had a whole life career in TV for years after our original show. Um, so more than any of us, she had more experience in TV and she is hyper aware of, of, you know, at least in her mind, what she thinks viewers want to see. Mm. You guys had probably the one of the main storylines, at least like coming into this. And I would say like at the beginning when it was focusing on like the downfall of yours friendship um, and we touched on it. It was like a heavy subject. But then once you guys kind of patched that up right away, it seemed like uh, you guys were like fine and kind of like rekindling a friendship after that. But then flash forward to present time and like it seems like she's kind of like the, you know, stepchild of the group. You know, I like, think. You know, through the edit, there's a perception that, yes, we patched and moved on. But what you have to understand is any time and most humans are in a stressful setting with someone they don't trust, you're generally going to do your best to keep peace. Um, I, I did not come there to, to fight, to have negativity, to have drama with anyone. I made that super clear to production. The only reason the issue had to come up to begin with was because it was the white elephant in the room. I wasn't, you know, we hadn't, we had not spoken in 21 years. I wasn't about to just pretend that didn't happen. Um, and the fact that it happened to many, many other cast members, it wasn't just Melissa and I either, by the way. So it was clearly a, a pattern driven out of narcissism. Again, I think there's just a history of narcissism there. I was genuine in the fact that I was willing to hear an apology. Um, and as I said very clearly in in the final cut, you know, that something like that takes years to overcome, to rekindle trust. It's all about trust. If I don't trust you, there's no relationship to be had. I can be kind to you, but that doesn't mean we have a friendship. Um, that's what happened. Uh, I think there was a, a misunderstanding by by most viewers that we rekindled some sort of friendship, but it was more keeping peace. Um, as in fact, as as time went on during our time filming, I saw that there was definitely not a person to be trusted. And then seeing the final cut made me understand that this is beyond a person I will I will never trust. <laughs> like there's some serious mental health issues there. Um, and I wish her well. I really would love for her to 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 do some soul searching and own the behavior that's what it boils down to there's you know again through narcissism narciss narcissists classically are incapable of owning their own behaviors and always push the blame off onto others um and that's all i'll say about that yeah i mean that's all you can really say about it you know what i mean so it's good to kind of i don't i don't wish her bad in life i i don't you know i always hope and see the best in people 
Um, I don't I don't think most people are genuinely evil. I think most of us have trauma behaviors that we act out of, um, mm-hmm. which are often counterproductive and destructive. And I think that's the case here. Um, and I think most anyone who's come out of some sort of uh, really restraining cult likely is going to have those kinds of issues. Um, but it takes a lot of deep work to move past that, I think, too. Yeah. They, I think, took, like, or missed, actually, like, an opportunity with your HIV story because you have what started with Pedro originally. Yeah. When, was he was, like, the first HIV story to hit reality TV. You, yep. had, you had an opportunity there since, in all essence, it's very doubtful that we'll get, like, a San Francisco homecoming to touch on that topic. They could have right. very easily used, you know, your story on this homecoming to kind of fill the void that we might not get of that potential topic in the future to show like, Hey, here's like a gay man thriving despite that, you know? Look, and- yeah. Look how far society's come from, you know, it was probably like, I don't know, 93, 94, somewhere around that time when Pedro and San Francisco season happened. And up until then, you know, HIV was just, an unspeakable topic. It came loaded with moralizing baggage. It was seen as many still today view it as punishment. Um, and, and again, it was wrapped up in homophobia deeply at the time. It was just not a topic discussed openly generally, unless in some sort of negative way. Um, and Pedro was the first person to come forward, period, and, and start changing that storyline. And it was such a big deal that Clinton actually came to his funeral. Clinton, the president at the time, that's how big of a deal it was. And he changed a lot of people's perceptions starting then, including my own. That's the crazy wild part of this. It's serendipitous. You know, he was my first introduction to the topic in a healthy, normalized way. And here I am all these years later in my life now facing the same challenge, but an entirely different era. So, yes such a missed opportunity to go back, revisit the work that they did originally that was hugely positive and to connect the dots between how far society and science and medicine has come. You know, he died from it when he was, I think, 24 years old. Mm. That was the norm back then. You died from it. That's what we all thought or what we all knew. Now, all these years later, we live with treatment, more or less totally normal lives. Um, that was such a missed opportunity. Yes. It's a bummer. Yeah. We can only hope that like this sets like sort of a a precedent now that there's been three of these going forward to kind of look and go to back to the drawing board a little bit and decide like if they ever go through with more of these, like, okay, this is something that the audience likes. This is something that maybe we shouldn't follow with this formula. And, uh, I guess you can only hope for the best. Less of the nonsense, but you know what? Unfortunately, with when you think about now the seasons that are left and are, are likely to do it, <laughs> it doesn't bode well for that. <laughs> Listen, Real World Miami is like the hot thing on the market right now. They've got all seven on board. It's a matter of uh, BMP pulling the trigger. Oh, you know, the, you know more than me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know who is who is open and who's not. You would think we all know each other well, but we really don't. Um, it's a strange world. It's work relationships, you know. In a way, yeah, it is kind yeah. of like that. <laughs> well, since we're on the topic of relationships, we saw you and Paul kind of reunited and had your hash out. It happened like very early into the season. Like I think that was another one of the big things going into it that uh, everybody was looking forward to being tapped into. It kind of ended uh, relatively quick into the series. Who maybe organized that? Did you have his contact info or did production give it to you? Yeah, that was actually something that I was very against. I had, We had not spoken in 15 years. I was very okay with, with it being that way. I did not need to dig that relationship out of the closet to revisit it. I said no over and over and over again production really wouldn't let it go paul actually came to visit towards the end of our time there um they flipped the timeline all around it even i have had a hard time following the real timeline but um they were so set on it you know days into filming they were still pushing and i was still saying no 
then it just it got to a point where the fear hit me they're going to do this regardless so i made the calculated decision to say yes so at least i had a little bit of control over how it played out not being surprised by him um they arranged every bit of it paul and i were not in communication whatsoever i i did have his cell number from many years before i just handed over to them and they made it happen um and then you know one afternoon production let me know it's happening today be prepared for paul um that evening boom he showed up and i literally hadn't seen or spoken to him in 15 years since we we separated and we separated in really ugly ways that i really didn't want to talk about period much less with public um but it was part of the <laughs> white elephant in the room and yeah you know it ended up being a positive experience and then i i think it allowed me to have empathy for us and what we had gone through before and so much of it wasn't our own our anything we had any control over it was an element of the time we lived in got ourselves into something way bigger than us. Um, and so much of what ended up being toxic in our relationship was no fault of our own. Um, I think it was the first time I could truly frame it in that way and, and have peace with that. Um, but I would have preferred to honestly just left it where it was and not see him ever again. I would have been very okay with that. Was that ever discussed, like, in the process, what getting you to co-sign for the show in general? Like, did they say, like, okay, this is most likely going to be talked about? Or was that ever discussed at all? Oh, yeah. They were clear from the start. This is a huge element of your storyline. We have to visit this. And I was okay with visiting it. I just didn't want him to come. Mm -hmm. I didn't want him to be part of it. Um, and they just wouldn't let it go. It was very clear. I'm pretty sure they were going to do it either way. They were not going to let that one slide. Um, and again, you know, this is another one where I would have enjoyed more if my story with HIV were part of the storyline more than me revisiting Paul and to have a really, really awkward conversation <laughs> with, with a guy who's now dressed like a pimp. <laughs> yeah, he looked much different. I was like, is this the same guy? They just yeah. like, find some well, guy. Yeah. I was shocked too. I, I knew, I knew he, you know, the last time we'd seen each other, he was really evolving as a person because when you yeah. have to think about it, he, he came from a conservative military family. He been in the ROTC and military, his whole school and, and professional life. He was now in his, at that point, he was in his early thirties, I think. And that's all his, his whole life had been was, you know, this narrow, box that he had to fit into so i think once he finally did get out of the military and started discovering who he really wanted to be it was something very different than the person i knew so yeah it was a shock even to me like what i feel like i need to make a point of this because i'm having a really hard time having this conversation with you looking like this <laughs> And he had to have known what the conversation was going to be. So what in the world would make you think that that is a good idea? I don't know. I don't get that. <laughs> do, do you know how eager he was to show up? Like, was there trepidation on his part? Or was he, like, very open to the process? I have no idea. I I think he genuinely wanted to make amends with me and, and apologize. He's tried over the years. I just... Mm. The thing is, is I moved on ages ago from my own well-being. You know, it's like you have to forgive and forget and move on. I think it's been hanging over him as a cloud ever since. And I think he genuinely wanted that off his shoulders. I just, this is not the place to do it. <laughs> I think he was absolutely shocked that I was there doing it, knowing what the experience was for us in the long run. Um, I don't think he could believe that I was there um i don't i don't think he probably was super pumped about coming to do it but i think there was probably a part of him that just saw it as his only opportunity to kind of close that chapter for good for his sake purely for, for his sake yeah so, so where do you maybe stand now that the whole thing's kind of unfolded like with uh you in production as far as like would you do another show for them in the future or you think this is kind of like uh 
the symbolic end for you. Hey, for the right amount, I will talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised they haven't been uh, giving you all. -star. Have they been giving you challenge all star calls? Oh, they have for years. Okay, yeah, because they got like the same thing pretty much on Paramount Plus. Now they're doing like the whole uh, challenge reunions, basically. Yeah, that that's not my scene. I had I did one of those ages ago, and I had a lot of fun. But you won. Uh, I did. I, I yeah. totally won that one. But you know, it, I think it is a very different show now. Entirely different types of people. I don't know most of those cast members. It's just like I don't relate to it in any way at all. Um, not interested. However, again, for the right amount, I would talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they would never. They would never offer that amount. That's the. That's the thing I know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you did make an appearance on Dawson's Creek, though. That's one thing you did. Ages, ages ago. Yeah. And that was, you know, as we were talking about in the beginning, doors that are open for you. That was one of those doors that was open for me, which at the time was a big deal. The reasoning behind it is because reality, uh, Dawson's Creek at the time was one of the biggest, most popular TV shows. Um, and though half of Hollywood is gay at the time, no one was out. It was incredibly taboo to be out that was essentially like career ending um at the time so uh the production at dawson's creek wanted to make a, a big deal of of launching someone who was openly out onto the show um that was the real intention behind it playing a straight guy you know all of this now is ubiquitous yeah People today don't understand like what what's the big deal because it's the norm now but back then that was super super taboo and cutting edge which is just funny to think now um but I, again i i did not want to be an actor it was not my my goal going into it it was just a door that was open and a fun experience um i think if anything that that experience proved to me that's not the world i want to be in <laughs> were, were you did you consider yourself a good actor though like did it come natural to you or no not at all I can't tell you how many takes we had to do for for the corny shots that we did. Um, I had no, I, I no, I'd never acted before. I was not in any sort of, you know, I was I was not a thespian in school. My one experience had been that acting class I took in college, which was genuinely to get over a fear of public speaking. Um, Every college has to take has to, it's like a requirement. You have to take like a public sort of speaking class in college. It's like Maybe now you do, and back then no, you did not. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, it was not the norm for us all to be in front of people as we all we are today. Mm -hmm. um, I did a I I was a, a language major, so I was constantly doing presentations in foreign languages. So. That was why I was working to get over that fear. Mm -hmm. Not related to acting. <laughs> what, what about your encounter with Beyonce? What was that like? <laughs> Still to this day, the, mo the most surreal moment of my life. Um, I, I, you know, at the time, it was when she was breaking off from Destiny's Child to become solo artist. But so she was al already huge and well known. Um, I wasn't so much a Destiny's Child fan per se, or a Beyonce fan, but we all at the time knew who they were. Um, it was a huge star. So when I, I agreed to do this photo shoot, which was, it was a, a, a collage of different up and coming performers from the time, comedians, actors, singers, reality TV people, et cetera. And um, we were all thrown together without knowing who was gonna be part of it until we got there. So the first shoot is with me and Beyonce. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, oh my God, I'm mortified. I'm not worthy to be in this presence. <laughs> you know, and I, at the time, she was so gorgeous. I thought like, she must be 30 years old. Yeah. I didn't realize at the time she was only like 18. She was younger than me, um, wow. but had just a huge presence just as a human. Forget yeah. who she actually was. And she turned to me at one point in the photo shoot, Shiley, and goes, I know who you are. And I was like, you know who I am? Do you know who you are? <laughs> I will never forget that. Um, super cool photos. And um, yeah, and then 
she's now gone on and you see and now we all know who Beyonce is. Wow. Yeah, I, it's like crazy. You would be surprised the amount of like public figures that are like or are or were real world fans that are kind of just more like closeted with it. Yeah, I think a lot of um, it makes sense when you think about it. I, I think probably a lot of genuine celebrities who are cut off from the real world in a lot of ways um, to protect their privacy. You know, this is sort of, I, I, it makes sense to me, it would be a peep into the average person's world. Yeah. Boy, do they have a skewed, skewed version of it, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> But especially back then, I think it makes a lot of sense when it was still more just documentary style, where it was people's day to day lives. Um, it makes total sense to me now why they would have been watching. But at the time, yeah, it shocked me. Like, why do you watch this? This is incredible. So would you say you were more so like originally coming off your uh, first New Orleans show? Would you say like you were received like? proper like everybody was like oh like you know you're a big part of like my viewing experience or like or would you say that maybe you were looked at sideways coming out of reality tv that's a good question and it was both um first off it was really difficult at the time to understand the general sentiment of what people thought about you coming out of those shows back then again the internet was in its infancy the majority were not online yet only like upper middle class kids in urban areas, suburban areas had access to the internet. Most people were not online. And, and at this point, I mean, dial up. <laughs> no yeah. one had no one had a phone in their hand that was connected to the internet. Um, so, you know, that direct feedback that you get now was just not a thing. Um, the closest it would get was, yes, there was some internet. I had a website that I set up that was one of the sort of, it became sort of the earlier community gay sites that was just oriented towards the gay population, but not as a hookup site. Yeah. Um, Tinder before Tinder. <laughs> right. It, so there was, you know, some sense of feedback that I got there, but of course those are people specifically wanting to reach me. So I'm, um, didn't get the full picture we got some fan mail and by that i mean literally handwritten letters that mcb would forward to us so you know we could anecdotally tell what people thought but we really didn't have a sense until going back to do this homecoming and now hearing from people now who are reflecting on their experience from it the first time the thing has been the most shocking to me is i had always assumed that the majority of people watching um were at the time in their 20s 30s yeah, there was a lot of those people, but what I now understand that's still shocking to me is how many, you know, teens who were at the time 11, 12, 13 who were watching. Huge chunk of the viewers were actually really young at the time. Um, and it was super meaningful and impactful to those kids. It laid foundations for them, for better or worse. <laughs> so it's like you almost can't process it when you live it out you know like you get done filming something and you're just kind of like ah whatever it's over with i want to be done like you know actors do like fifty thousand hours of like footage that, that way like once their movies are out they almost like don't care and they go back to their lives whereas like you almost like don't realize when people are coming up to you like oh you're so great i'm such a big fan like you're just almost like star not i don't want to say starstruck but like you're kind of just like like what? Like you just don't really understand the true gravity of it. Yeah. Again, it's the the parasocial aspect of reality TV where, <laughs> you know, people from reality TV shows, there's a level of accessibility that feels very different from A-level celebrities who are actually being paid to do what they do and to have their own private lives and bubbles. Um, so you know we fall somewhere in this gray middle where we are yeah. way more accessible um in reality and in, in parasocial relationships and people do grow up watching these shows and and becoming so mentally connected to all of us that in a way that people do feel like they actually know us personally even though it's a very one-dimensional version of us yeah well, uh, I'm glad we were able to connect and uh, finally meet and get to make this happen. Um, you know, I'm very glad to see that you've kind of gotten more of a positive experience maybe this time around than maybe you did the first time. Yeah. It's been so, a great, 
a great book in this time around. Yeah. Uh, hopefully you guys get that Emmy. Is that still in the works or is that kind of that? No, Emmy? we did not get an Emmy. Nope. It didn't uh -huh. happen. Um, and I, I, I could spend a whole another hour talking about my, my theories there, but I'm going to hold them. But no, we did not. We did not get an Emmy. Listen, and someone has it out for you. <laughs> I do think it has something to do with the, the, the choices in the final edit. You know, if, if 50 percent of the show is absolute chaos, then what's new and, and interesting about that? Yeah, exactly. Is that Emmy worthy? I don't I don't think so. So maybe they're justified then. Yeah, but also when you look at who who did get the nominations, you're like, oh, ouch. <laughs> who who was it again that got the nominations for the Emmy? It's just honestly, some of it's RuPaul, which this is like such a time for RuPaul to be recognized. Uh, but Honestly, most of them are shows. I don't really watch TV, much Me less is. reality TV. So they're not, I, I couldn't tell you because they're not shows that I, I'm familiar with. Mm. Um, but, you know, definitely hardcore classic reality TV. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thanks again for stopping by and hopping on here. Pleasure. My pleasure, Mike. It was great to finally meet you. All right. Take All care. Right, uh, great rest of your day.